Hello creators, and welcome back. And welcome to our 2023 Halloween episode. I'm so excited to share this book with you, as it's such a well-loved classic with musical fans and literature fans alike. So, without further ado, today I'm going to be reading the first chapter of The Phantom of the Opera, published in 1909 by the French author Gaston Leroux and inspired by actual historical events that happened at the Paris Opera House. Now, even if you haven't seen it in person, I think we are all familiar by now with the very famous Broadway musical adaptation by Andrew Lloyd Webber, which first graced our stages in 1986. It was also made into a movie in 1925, starring Mary Philbin, and again in 2004, starring Gerard Butler. Just a word of warning, Um, the novel is a lot darker and it's more obsessive than the musical. It tells the story of an investigation into the haunting of the Paris Opera House by a grotesque and terrifying phantom. The phantom falls in love with a young soprano named Christine and what follows very quickly turns into a nightmare. So, take a moment to get cosy and comfortable and drift off. Chapter 1. Is it the ghost? It was the evening on which M. M. de Bien and Paulini, the managers of the opera, were giving a last gala performance to mark their retirement. Suddenly, the dressing room of La Sorelli, one of the principal dancers, was invaded by half a dozen ladies of the ballet, who had come up from the stage after dancing Polyucht. They rushed in amid great confusion, some giving vent to forced and unnatural laughter, others to cries of terror. Sorelli, who wished to be alone for a moment to run through the speech which he had to make to the resigning managers, looked around angrily at the mad and tumultuous crowd. It was little Jams, the girl with the tip-tilted nose, the forget-me-not eyes, the rose-red cheeks, and the lily-white neck and shoulders, who gave the explanation in a trembling voice. It's the ghost. She locked the door. Sorelli's dressing room was fitted up with official commonplace elegance. A pier glass, a sofa, a dressing table, and a cupboard or two provided the necessary furniture. On the walls hung a few engravings, relics of the mother, who had known the glories of the old opera in Rue Le Pelletier, portraits of Vestry, Gardel, Dupont, Bigatini, But the room seemed a palace to the brats of the corps de ballet, who were lodged in common dressing rooms where they spent their time singing, quarrelling, smacking the dresses and hairdressers, and buying one another glass of cassis, beer, or even rum, until the call boy's bell rang. Sorelli was very superstitious. She shuddered when she heard little Jams speak of the ghost, called her a silly little fool, and then, as she was the first to believe in ghosts in general, and the opera ghost in particular, at once asked for details. Have you seen him? As plainly as I see you now, said little Jams, whose legs were giving way beneath her, and she dropped with a moan into a chair. Thereupon, little Jairie, the girl with eyes black as sloes, hair black as ink and swarthy complexion, and a poor little skin stretched over poor little bones, little Jairie added, If that's the ghost, he's very ugly. Oh yes, cried the chorus of ballet girls, and they all began to talk together. The ghost had appeared to them in the shape of a gentleman in dress clothes, who had suddenly stood before them in the passage without their knowing where he came from. He seemed to have come straight through the wall. Pooh, said one of them, 
who had more or less kept her head. You see the ghost everywhere. And it was true. For several months, there had been nothing discussed at the Opera House, but this ghost in dress clothes, who stalked about the building, from top to bottom, like a shadow, who spoke to nobody, to whom nobody dared speak, and who vanished as soon as he was seen. No one knowing how or where. As became a real ghost, he made no noise in walking. People began by laughing and making fun of his spectre dressed like a man of fashion or an undertaker, but the ghost legends soon swelled to enormous proportions among the corps de ballet, and the girls pretended to have met this supernatural being more or less often. And those who laughed the loudest were not the most at ease. When he did not show himself, he betrayed his presence or his passing by accident, comic or serious, for which the general superstition held him responsible. Had anyone met with a fool or suffered a practical joke at the hands of one of the other girls, or lost a powder puff, it was at once the fault of the ghost, of the opera ghost. After all, who had seen him? You meet so many men in dress clothes at the opera house, who are not ghosts. But this dress suit had peculiarity of its own. It covered a skeleton, at least, so the ballet girls said, and of course, it had a death's head. Was all this serious? The truth is that the idea of the skeleton came from the description of the ghost given by Joseph Bouquet, the chief scene shifter, who had really seen the ghost. He had run up against the ghost on the little staircase by the footlights which leads to the cellars. He had seen him for a second, for the ghost had fled. And to anyone who cared to listen to him, he said, He is extraordinarily thin, and his dress coat hangs from a skeleton frame. His eyes are so deep that you can hardly see the fixed pupils. You just see two big black holes, as in a dead man's skull. His skin, which is stretched across his bones like a drumhead, is not white, but a nasty yellow. His nose is so little worth talking about that you can't see it side-face. And the absence of that nose is a horrible thing to look at. All the hair he has is three or four long dark locks on his forehead and behind his ears. This chief scene shifter was a serious, sober, steady man, very slow at imagining things. His words were received with interest and amazement, and soon there were other people to say that they too had met a man in dress clothes with a death's head on his shoulders. Sensible men who had wind of the story began by saying that Joseph Bouquet had been the victim of a joke played by one of his assistants, and then, one after the other, there came a series of incidents so curious and so inexplicable that the very shrewdest people began to feel uneasy. For instance, a fireman is a brave fellow. He fears nothing, least of all fire. Well, the fireman in question, who had gone to make a round of inspection in the cellars, and who, it seems, had ventured a little farther than usual, suddenly reappeared on the stage, pale, scared, trembling, with his eyes starting out of his head, and practically fainted in the arms of the proud mother of little Jams. And why? Because he had seen, coming towards him, at the level of his head, but without a body attached to it, a head of fire. And, as I said, a fireman is not afraid of fire. The fireman's name was Pampin. The corps de ballet was flung into consternation. At first sight, this fiery head in no way corresponded with Joseph Bouquet's description of the ghost. But the young ladies soon persuaded themselves that the ghost had several heads, which he changed about as he pleased. And of course, they at once imagined that they were in the greatest danger. Once a fireman did not hesitate to faint, leaders and front row and back row girls alike had plenty of excuses for the fright that made them quicken their pace when passing some dark corner or ill-lighted corridor. Sorelli herself, on the day after the adventure of the fireman, placed a horseshoe on the table in front of the stage doorkeeper's box, which everyone who had entered the opera house otherwise than as a spectator, must touch before setting foot on the first tread of the staircase. This horseshoe was not invented by me, 
any more than any other part of the story, alas, and may still be seen on the table in the passage outside the stage doorkeeper's box when you enter the opera through the court known as the Cour de l'Administration. To return to the evening in question, it's the ghost, little Jeanne said cried. An agonizing silence now reigned in the dressing room. Nothing was heard but the hard breathing of the girls. At last, Jeanne's flinging herself upon the father's corner of the wall, with every mark of real terror in her face, whispered, Listen. Everybody seemed to hear a rustling outside the door. There was no sound of footsteps. It was like light silk sliding over the panel. Then it stopped. Sorelli tried to show more pluck than the others. She went up to the door and, in a quavering voice, asked, Who's there? But nobody answered. Then, feeling all eyes upon her, watching her last movement, she made an effort to show courage and said very loudly, Is there anyone behind the door? Oh, yes, yes, of course there is, cried that little dried plum of a Meg Gieri, heroically holding Sorelli back by her gauze skirt. Whatever you do, don't open the door. Oh, Lord, don't open the door. But Sorelli, armed with a dagger that never left her, turned the key and drew back to the door. While the ballet girls retreated to the inner dressing room and Meg Geary sighed. Mother, mother. Sorelli looked into the passage bravely. It was empty. A gas flame in its glass prison cast a red and suspicious light into the surrounding darkness without succeeding in dispelling it and the dancer slammed the door again with a deep sigh. No, she said, there is no one there. Still, we saw him, James declared, returning with timid little steps to her place beside Sorelli. He must be somewhere prowling about. I shan't go back to dress. We had better all go down to the foyer together, at once, for the speech, and we will come back up again together. And the child reverently touched the little coral finger, which she wore as a charm against bad luck. While Sorelli, stealthily, with the tip of her pink right thumbnail, made a St. Andrew's cross on the wooden ring which adorned the forefinger of her hand. She said to the little ballet girls, Come, children, pull yourselves together. I dare say no one has ever seen the ghost. Yes, yes, we saw him. We saw him just now, cried the girls. He had his death's head and his dress coat, just as when he appeared to Joseph Bouquet. And Gabriel saw him too, said James. Only yesterday, yesterday afternoon, in broad daylight. Gabriel, the chorus master. Why, yes. Didn't you know? And he was wearing his dress clothes, in broad daylight. Who? Gabriel? Why, no, the ghost. Certainly. Gabriel told me so himself. That's what he knew him by. Gabriel was in the stage manager's office. Suddenly, the door opened and the Persian entered. You know the Persian has the evil eye. Oh yes, answered the little ballet girls in chorus, warding off ill luck by pointing their forefinger and little finger at the absent Persian, while their second and third fingers were bent on the palm and held down by the thumb. And you know how superstitious Gabriel is, continued Jams. However, he is always polite when he meets the Persian. He just puts his hand in his pocket and touches his keys. Well, the moment the Persian appeared in the doorway, Gabriel gave one jump from his chair to the lock of the cupboard, so as to touch iron. In doing so, he tore a whole skirt of his overcoat on a nail, hurrying to get out of the room. He banged his forehead against a hat peg and gave himself a huge bump. Then, suddenly stepping back, he skinned his arm on the screen, near the piano. He tried to lean on the piano, but the lid fell on his hands and crushed his fingers. He rushed out of the office like a madman, slipped on the staircase, and came down the whole of the first flight on his back. I was just passing by with Mother. We picked him up. He was covered with bruises and his face was all over blood. We were frightened out of our lives, but all at once he began to thank Providence that he had got off so cheaply. Then he told us what had frightened him. He had seen the ghost behind the Persian. The ghost with the death's head, just like Joseph Bouquet's description. James had told her story ever so quickly, 
as though the ghost were at her heels, and was quite out of breath at the finish. A silence followed, while Sorelli polished her nails in great excitement. It was broken by little Guiri, who said, Joseph Bouquet would do better to hold his tongue. Why should he hold his tongue? asked somebody. That's mother's opinion, replied Meg, lowering her voice and looking all about her as though fearing lest other ears than those present might overhear. And why is it your mother's opinion? Hush, mother says the ghost doesn't like to be talked about. And why does your mother say so? Because, because, nothing. This reticence exasperated the curiosity of the young ladies, who crowded round little Geary, who crowded round little Geary, begging her to explain herself. They were there, side by side, leaning forward simultaneously in one movement of entreaty and fear, communicating their terror to one another, taking a keen pleasure in feeling their blood freeze in their veins. I swore not to tell, gasped Meg, but they left her no peace and promised her to keep the secret. Until Meg, burning to say all she knew, began with her eyes fixed on the door. Well, it's because of the private box. What private box? The ghost's box. Has the ghost a box? Oh, do tell us, do tell us. Not so loud, said Meg. It's box five, you know. The box on the grand tier next to the stage box on the left. Oh, nonsense. I tell you it is. Mother has charge of it, but you swear you won't say a word. Of course, of course. Well, that's the ghost's box. No one has had it for over a month, except the ghost. And orders have been given at the box office that it must never be sold. And does the ghost really come there? Yes. Then somebody does come. Why, no, the ghost comes, but there is nobody there. The little ballet girls exchanged glances. If the ghost came to the box, he must be seen, because he wore a dress coat and a death's head. This was what they tried to make Meg understand. But she replied, That's just it. The ghost is not seen, and he has no dress coat and no head. All that talk about his death's head and his head of fire is nonsense. There's nothing in it. You only hear him when he's in the box. Mother has never seen him, but she has heard him. Mother knows because she gives him his program. Sorelli interfered. Gieri, child, you're getting at us. Thereupon, little Gieri began to cry. I ought to have held my tongue. If mother ever came to know, but I was quite right. Joseph Piquet had no business to talk of things that don't concern him. It will bring him bad luck. Mother was saying so last night. There was a sound of hurried and heavy footsteps in the passage. There was a sound of hurried and heavy footsteps in the passage, and a breathless voice cried, Cecile, Cecile, are you there? It's mother's voice, said James. What's the matter? She opened the door. A respectable lady, built on the lines of a Pomeranian grenadier, burst into the dressing room and dropped, groaning to a vacant armchair. Her eyes rolled madly in her brick-dust-coloured face. How awful, she said. How awful. What? What? Joseph Bouquet. What about him? Joseph Bouquet is dead. The room became filled with exclamations, with astonished outcries, with scared requests for explanations. Yes, he was found hanging in the third floor cellar. It's the ghost, little Guerri blurted, as though in spite of herself. But she at once corrected herself with her hands pressed to her mouth. No, no, I didn't say it, I didn't say it. All around her, her panic-stricken companions repeated under their breaths, Yes, it must be the ghost. Sorelli was very pale. I shall never be able to recite my speech, she said. 
Ma Jams gave her opinion while she emptied a glass of liqueur that happened to be standing on a table. The ghost must have something to do with it. The truth is that no one ever knew how Joseph Bouquet met his death. The verdict at the inquest was natural suicide. In the memoirs of the manager, M. Moncharmin, one of the joint managers who succeeded M. M. Debien and Poligny, describes the incident as follows. A grievous accident spoiled with little party which M. M. Debien and Poligny gave to celebrate their retirement. It was in the manager's office when Mercier, the acting manager, suddenly came darting in. He seemed half mad and told me that the body of a scene shifter had been found hanging in the third cellar under the stage, between a farmhouse and a scene from Roy de Lahore. I shouted, come and cut him down. By the time I had rushed down the staircase and the Jacob's ladder, the man was no longer hanging from his rope. So this is an event which M. Moshaman thinks natural. A man hangs at the end of a rope, they go to cut him down, the rope has disappeared. Oh, M. Moshaman found a very simple explanation. Listen to him. It was just after the ballet. The leaders and the dancing girls lost no time in taking their precautions against the evil eye. There you are. Picture the corps de ballet scuttling down the Jacob's ladder and dividing the suicide's rope among themselves in less time than it takes to write. When, on the other hand, I think of the exact spot where the body was discovered, the third cellar underneath the stage. Imagine that somebody must have been interested in seeing that rope disappeared after it had affected its purpose, and time will show if I am wrong. The horrid news soon spread all over the opera, where Joseph Bouquet was very popular. The dressing rooms emptied and the ballet girls, crowding round Sorelli like timid sheep around their shepherdess, made for the foyer through the ill-lit passages and staircases, trotting as fast as their little pink legs could carry them. <laughs> 